Okay. <clears throat> Do we have all our panelists? Yes, we do. And and they've been asked to unmute and turn their video on. Charlie, yeah, we, we're about oh, I thought we were supposed to keep them off. <laughs> yep, I was gonna turn them on when you introduce them. Okay. Um, so, so let's go live to the audience. We are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 26th annual Duke Law National Security Law Conference this year in Zoom. And it's uh, been a lot of fun. We had our soft start yesterday with the panel on artificial intelligence. And we're going to have a very busy day today. And so we're going to do everything we can to stay on, on time. You will be able to ask questions, but take a look at the bottom of the screen and you'll see the Q&A function. And that's where you'll submit your questions. I can't promise you that we're gonna to get to all of them, but we're gonna do the best we can. We um, have a, a fantastic panel to start the today's events. And really, I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen such a, such a powerful panel on the topic of civil military relations. We have all the all the stars. The first one I'd like to introduce is uh, Professor Rosa Brooks. Uh, she's at Georgetown. We could go back many years. Uh, what a fantastic career she's had. And she's written one of the most important books on this topic. Uh, a few years ago, she worked in the Pentagon. But I, Rosa, I, I just got to talk about this book because uh, I've just finished it. I am going to write a review on it. It's fantastic. To the point where if somebody tries to talk to me about uh, you know, reforming the police or something and they haven't read your book, I'm going to lose interest in that conversation pretty quickly. Uh, our next panelist, really honored to have General Dempsey join us. Um, General Dempsey uh, has been a Rubenstein fellow. He really needs no introduction. Of course, he was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 41 year career in the military, did everything. He too has a book out, which I have just recently read, sir. I'm a little embarrassed. I only got around to reading it recently and I, and I do highly recommend it. It's interesting because he co-authored co it with a 41 year old and they make the point, a 41 year old with a 41 year old, a 41 year veteran of military service. And then the next, uh, our next panelist is Corey Shockey. And wow, uh, what a fantastic person she's been in this space. She too has a book and she has several books. Uh, I don't actually have the one that she's written on civil military relations with General Mattis. It's Warrior and Citizens. And, uh, and it's really, it's one of those basic books that everybody needs to read if they're gonna be in this space. Uh, she tells me she has an op-ed coming out in the New York Times about the, uh, the role or the relationship of veterans and the events of uh, January 6th. I told her I have a blog post coming out. We'll, we'll compare notes. Uh, she's a heck of, Dr. Shockey is a, a heck of a lot smarter than me. So uh, I have some real trepidation. And finally, uh, we're going to have uh, Professor Peter Fever here with us. And Peter, I think is, is really uh, often considered the, the dean of civil military relations. Uh, he was 30 years, Peter, I think it's been like 30 years since you first started getting interested in this area. He doesn't have a current book out uh, on this topic, but he has a book coming out with another co-author with another one of the, the titans in this area, Jim Golby. And I think his working title, and Peter, correct me if I get this wrong, it's uh, Thanks for Your Service, The Causes and Consequences of Public Confidence in the U.S. Military. You know, it, it may, may it just fire, uh, you know, before <laughs> once the publisher and so forth. So um, what I'd like to do is to start out our dialogue here with what I call kind of a, a lightning round. And I'm going to ask each of you to briefly in just a couple of minutes, give your perspective on this current state of civil military relations. And 
what challenges, if any, do you think are being presented right now, currently? And perhaps we can start with uh, Rosa. Sure, thank you, Charlie. It's, it's terrific to be here. And I have to apologize in advance. Um, there is construction going on and you might hear strange noises from time to time. If it gets too bad, I'm gonna go like this and move to somebody else and mute um, because it, sometimes it's jackhammers and power drills. Uh, um, so that's a big question. I think I would say that civil military relations are not as bad as people sometimes think. Um, that there is, I think, I, think, I think culturally we like to have crises because crises are fun. Uh, and crises mean that we all need to leap into action and talk about them. I don't think that civil military relations is in crisis in any meaningful sense. That being said, I think that there are areas for concern and, and one of the challenges, I don't know that it's even a civil military relations crisis or, or, or even challenge, but I think one of the challenges is that in, within the Defense Department, uh, within the last administration, partly inadvertently, partly not so inadvertently, a lot of the civilian expertise was relatively sidelined and a lot of people left. Uh, I think that fixing that, getting, getting good people back in there is going to be a big challenge and breaking whatever habits have formed in the, in the meantime of uh, focusing primarily on the military expertise of the joint staff and, and, uh, and other parts of the, the apparatus there, uh, that's gonna take a while to shift, um, but I don't think we're in a crisis. Uh, General Dempsey. Yeah, thanks, Charlie, and, and uh, good to be with you and all these. This is quite a remarkable panel. And I, I think, Rosa, when you were saying, you know, that you've got potentially some loud noises in the background, I consider that your effort to make me feel comfortable in this environment. Um, you know, to Rosa's point, I, I think, I don't think there's a civil crisis. I do think that it is a problem when civil relations are so prominent in our collective consciousness. You know, in other words, um, the intense scrutiny is not conducive to the kind of civ mill relations that I think we all aspire uh, for our country to enjoy. And, and to Rosa's point, if this were, you know, if we were typing this out on a computer, um, the, the civ mill acronym, you'd have the civ side of it in, in four font and you'd have the mill part of it, you know, in 24 font. I think we're, we're out of balance a bit. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Corey, uh, Dr. Shockey rather. So I actually think civil military relations are in pretty good shape. And that's amazing given the pressure they have been under of four years of norm breaking and corrosion by the Trump administration. Uh, I think the mistakes of last summer both by the Secretary of Defense as a senior civilian in the department and by General Milley, the chairman, were actually, they were you know, mistakes in the present, but how they compensated for it, I think actually strengthened the norms of civil military relations. And uh, I think the fact that we didn't see, that we saw such stability and such reticence by the military establishment to include a civilian leadership uh, to be pulled into the election and its aftermath, I think is a positive result of the fact that uh, the military got such a shock. They shouldn't have been shocked uh, to four, three and a half years into the Trump administration to be politicized so ruthlessly, but they were, and they used it to good effect by um, backing away, or, uh, buffering themselves against being used as a political force in the disputatiousness that President Trump and his um, accomplices put in place after they lost the election. So I actually think they're in pretty good shape. Uh, the couple of concerns though, one is the ease with which Congress sped through um, confirming the second recently retired general in four years to be the civilian secretary of defense suggests to me that the norm of civilian su supremacy that Rosa mentioned uh, actually is a lot weaker, particularly on the congressional side 
of enforcement for exactly the reason that retired General Dempsey emphasized, which is the military piece is in 24 font. And Peter, I just pitched it slow and over the plate to you, my friend. <laughs> Peter. So um, if you're, if depends what your baseline is. So Myanmar has a civil military crisis and we don't have a crisis like Myanmar. Uh, but if you say, have there been times where civil military relations were healthier than they are today? I'd say in the United States, I'd say absolutely. Uh, and, every, and of course, every administration comes into power believing that civil military relations got out of whack under their predecessor and they've got to fix something. That President Trump thought that when he came in in 2017, President Obama thought that in 2009, Bush thought that for sure in 2001. And so in some sense, just bringing in a new administration is going to bring in a re-examination of civil military relations. But I think that re-examination is especially important today and somewhat more fraught today than it was in 2017, just to pick the, the last point of reference. Uh, we have the imbalance that uh, a number of my panelists have mentioned already between the civilian side and the military side. That means that the military doesn't have a lot of muscle memory of working with strong civilians in the civilian uh, seats, um, whether from the NSC side or from the OSD side. Now they will have very strong civilians. It's a pretty strong civilian team that the uh, the President Biden has assembled, and the military is going to have to relearn how you interact with uh, with civilians who are uh, fully empowered, fully uh, capable, or um, worthy of the posts uh, seats that they're sitting in. And uh, that it's been a while since the military has faced that. And the last thing that worries me is uh, the breakdown in norms and and taboo and the violation of taboos without apparent consequence. Uh, Dr. Shockey mentioned the one regarding um, the, uh, the second waiver in, in as many as uh, four years, but there are many others that are, I'm, I'm especially worried about the way the President, President Trump um, was needling at um, officer versus enlisted uh, loyalties, draw, driving a wedge between um, the senior ranks of the military and the rank and file, uh, that, that was quite pernicious for a good order and discipline. Um, and and the, the administration, the, the current administration is gonna have to clean that up, I think. Uh, and I could list many others. But, and so I think there's a lot of uh, repair work to be done, uh, but I'm as confident as the rest of my panelists that, that the United States can do that because at the end of the day, as a friend of mine put it to me a while ago that you know other countries aspire to reach the depths to which we say the US has sunk in civil military relations that even when we say it's pretty bad, it's actually quite good in comparative terms. Well, all of that suggested like a million questions to me. And I do wanna jump ahead uh, to throw something out to you just on this, the getting sub great civilians into the Department of Defense. I think this is probably, bigger than the Department of Defense, but I'm getting concerned about uh, getting the right civilians to want to work in, in government. You know, the vetting process has gotten very, very difficult. Uh, for somebody coming from business, I think it's, it's going to be extremely difficult uh, to undergo that kind of scrutiny and the vetting process, or, or am I wrong? Uh, do you, and I'm afraid we might be left with the you know, professional politicians and the think tankers and, and no offense to anybody, but academics and so forth. God and not have... No offense to everyone Ouch. on this panel. <laughs> Ouch. Now, now, uh, now we have a crisis. Now, you now we have a crisis. crisis. But, yeah. but are the, number one, do you think that that is an issue? And if it is, is there anything we can do about it? Uh, getting, you know, talented civilians who may not have been in government before, or, uh, or aren't politicians, I, especially coming from business. Is that an issue or, or am I just wrong? Or are they not the right people to start out with? 
So I'm smiling they, because uh, this was Donald Rumsfeld's uh, hobby horse. Uh, oh, okay. Was, uh, so 15, 20 years ago, you, Secretary Rumsfeld uh, talked about how crazy was the vetting process, how difficult it was, and how it needed to be reformed. And that was 20 years ago. And it's much more in the, the quote unquote reforms since then, the changes since then have just made it that much more difficult. Yeah, Gates uh, said in his book, he spent 20 grand on lawyers and he was just coming from the CIA into, you know. So it's, it's unquestionably a hassle, but I'll just point out Lloyd Austin had no difficulty despite his defense industry uh, links. Mark Esper was a defense industry lobbyist. Jim Mattis was tangled up with Theranos. Um, so yes, it's a hassle, but I also think there's an important reason for the hassle. And so many of the Trump administration appointees demonstrate why we put people through that hassle, which is that conflicts of interest are real and they're injurious to the American government if they're not dealt with. Um, so yeah, it's a hassle, but there's a good reason it's a hassle. Charlie, if I could draw a parallel to thinking about policing, which is what I've been doing most lately. Uh, lots of cops I know complain very bitterly about the fact that they're under, they're under such public scrutiny, that there's a media spotlight shining on them all the time. Uh, and that makes everything so stressful. And my response to that is similar to what Corey just said. That's true. And it is stressful. But when the state gives you a badge, a gun, and the power to take away someone's liberty and take away their lives, it's fair to expect that they're going to scrutinize you on, you know, put you under a microscope in return. That's, that's fair, we, you, you know, it's, it's a fair exchange. And I think it's a similar issue here. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, an unpleasant, it's an unpleasant process, but as Corey says, uh, these are people who we're going to entrust with far, far greater power than, than a patrol officer with a, with a firearm. Uh, these are people we're entrusting with, you know, awesome powers of the US government and the US military, I'm okay with the fact that they're gonna to have to be raked over the coals a little before we put them into office. General Dempsey, do you have any thoughts on that? Are, are you comfortable that we're gonna be able to get enough of the good civilians to serve in defense and, and really the rest of government? Well, you know, I, I, we're, we're having this conversation coming out of a, a you know, kind of a, 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 how would we describe it? You know, a contentious, period of trying to get, uh, to have confidence in, in, in the elected officials and appointees. Um, but I am confident that, that there are, uh, you know, a generation or two back, they are actually aspiring to public service in a way that I find quite remarkable under the circumstances, but also quite comforting. I mean, you know, the students we have in AGS here at Duke, uh, I've, I've given presentations at, at many of the major universities around the country. And there is a, a genuine desire to serve the country. And we just got to make sure we don't let that slip away. Yeah, I think the challenge might come with the families of, of appointees when they get, you know, it's the nature of the media, I, I, I suppose that can be challenging. Yeah, Charlie, by the way, if, I just... if I could add one thing, Charlie, because the, the conversation was about the, <clears throat> was about the scrutiny on, that we, we require of those who are, um, nominated for civilian appointments. And uh, it, I actually uh, am a little uncomfortable that the, the vetting process on the military side doesn't seem as rigorous. Now, part of that is that, you know, if you're, if you're vetting, let's, let's take Lloyd, um, you know, they're in his two or three or four years out of the, out of the military, uh, he really only had time to do, you know, one or two things that were, that that would require scrutiny. Um, but you know, there's, there is a, I've always felt that we have to be careful about who we pick for the most senior positions in the military because they, they can have their own institutional parochialisms, if you will. And, and so I want to align myself with those who say, you know, the scrutiny may be uncomfortable, but it's, ne it's absolutely necessary, I think. Um, I, speaking of- can, Charlie, can I just sure, add, a, sure. add a point because uh, I'm 
not as enthusiastic about the uh, coal raking as my friends and co-panelists are. I, I do think that it's, uh, it's reached a point where it's, it's performative, it, it's public performance art, uh, and it's not actually truly uh, addressing the conflict of interest as evidenced by Corey's point that look at all the problems that somehow made it through the process and yet and got into their office with obvious uh, conflicts of interest. But so I would I would do some reform of the system. But if I only had a scarce resources of time and energy, I would put the reform effort in two other areas. First, in uh, human capital development across the interagency, so that the civilian side of OSD and then State Department. Um, would have the kind of professional development resources and, and, and program that the military has for developing their finest ones. Uh, the military has a pretty good professional development system. I don't think the rest of the national security establishment does, uh, or it uh, is not as good as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the great ad assets that the U.S. has over uh, compared to any of our NATO partners really, is the quality of our civilian and non-governmental expertise in national security. The US non-governmental national security expertise is as good as any, uh, better than any, I would say, in, in the rest of the world. Uh, and that's a national resource we should cultivate, which leads me to my third reform, where I would put some effort. And now I'm gonna gore your ox directly, Charlie. I'm gonna just, just poke the bear. But I would look at the veteran's preference for hiring inside DOD. I think that has a pernicious side effect of making it harder to recruit the best students that uh, General Dempsey mentioned that are civilians at great schools who, who would be great entry level um, civil service folks, particularly in DOD, I'm thinking. Um, and they can't get a job because there's a veteran's preference, which is understandable. And I'm fine with the veteran's preference helping them out at Health and Human Services or HUD or you know, Interior, elsewhere in the, in the government. But in the civilian side of DOD, um, I wonder if we couldn't reform that preference so as to open more doors for civilians going directly from uh, the civilian life into um, national security service. Well, let, let's talk about the bar on veterans in DOD, specifically the Secretary of Defense uh, that, that Corey and I think Rosa have raised. Um, you know, veterans are the only people that have a statutory bar. You can be a child molester and there's no statutory bar to becoming Secretary of Defense. Uh, Paula Thornhill, I think, uh, just wrote a very interesting piece about the history of that particular piece of legislation. And evidently, it didn't have anything to do with being control of the military. It had to do with some Marines trying to keep a Army or Navy officer from becoming Secretary of Defense. And then, in their view, imperiling, you know, uh, the Marine Corps. Uh, Given the vetting process that the confirmation involves, as well as everything else we've been talking about, is it really appropriate to, you know, tag veterans that way as somehow being suspect and not not worthy of being Secretary of Defense? Yes, yes, <laughs> I, it is. I, I haven't. It's not a leading question, was it, Rosa? Please tell me it wasn't. <laughs> Yes, it absolutely is, because diversity of experience produces better outcomes. So even if you are not worried about the subordination of the uniformed military to civilian control, you can still be concerned that Lloyd Austin's three years of civilian experience um, are going to make his network of uh, people he knows and trusts different than, say, um, uh, the head of Amazon, right? So, so President Biden said one of the major reasons for choosing Lloyd Austin was that the military knows logistics and, and vaccine distribution is going to be huge. It's true the military knows logistics. They are not the only people in the country who know logistics. 
Um, and it creates a corrosion in the confidence in civilian expertise running the department. And that actually matters for good outcomes. You get a ton of great military advice from within the institution, but military expertise isn't the only and probably not even the most important expertise for being a good Secretary of Defense. I will simply point out that the two best Secretaries of Defense in the history of our country, Elihu Root um, and Edwin Stanton, uh, had no military experience and they created a lot of the best things about military professionalism. And one of the worst defense secretaries of all time was venerated George Marshall, um, who left President Truman to deal with the problem of the insubordination of General MacArthur. Yes, I read your article and you articulate. I think that's, that's a great point. Uh, Rosa, I think Corey makes an important point about diversity of ideas and, and backgrounds and so forth. Do you think that we ought to have a statutory bar of anyone who has lived or worked inside the Beltway for seven years before they can become work in the Department of Defense? Uh, no, very possibly. No. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, but you know um, for. A couple points on this one actually going back to the issue of the veterans preference uh, and hiring below the level obviously of the Secretary of Defense that Peter raised just as a footnote to that I would add that the other detrimental impact that has is, is it it really reduces the number of women who go into the civilian workforce in DoD since we we are only just beginning to see significant percentage of women in the in the military itself if you have a veterans preference it's going to have the effect of meaning that 85% of the people who qualify for that hiring preference are going to be male still, uh, and in older generations, obviously even more. But that, that's just a side note. Um, on, the, on the issue of the waiver and uh, who should be sect up, I have a somewhat softer position on this than, than Corey, I think. Um, in the, if I were to rank you know, priority problems, I would not rank that particularly high. Um, I was not, for instance, when, when during the confirmation hearings for uh, Mattis, I thought there are so many things I'm worried about with the incoming administration and having Jim Mattis in the Secretary of Defense position is probably the lesser of not just two evils, but about 800 evils. Um, and I think, I think that in fact, without wanting to sort of dissect everything that happened under his, under his, uh, what do you, I don't know what you refer, under his, during his term, um, he, he certainly, I think, served as a powerful counterweight to the White House on many occasions in terms of being the one who was championing, championing diplomacy, development, et cetera, alliances. Um, so it kind of flipped the stereotypes. That said, I, I was dismayed when Biden picked uh, Lloyd Austin as his nominee in, for, for a couple of reasons. One, I think, yeah, we shouldn't get too obsessed with these, these sort of formalistic requirements, which, which I think can be, especially at that level, largely symbolic. Um, but I do think that as, as Peter said, um, to whatever extent it's premised on a norm, the more you ignore it, the more it starts to erode. And maybe we think that norm, it should not be important. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we think that we should revisit that. It's kind of arbitrary. Why seven years, maybe make it two years, maybe make people inside the beltway have to also have a five-year cooling off period and go live somewhere else. I mean, there are all kinds of ways we could, we could try to tweak this. Um, what worried me most, quite honestly, was not, the, uh, was not violation of civil military norms uh, in, in Biden's uh, choice of Lloyd Austin as his sec dep nominee. What bothered me was the violation of the norm that when Congress passes a law, you abide by it. Um, and that's what worried me most, that especially after the last four years, uh, that as, as you all know, it's not that there is a prohibition uh, on appointing a, a veteran without a seven year cooling off period. And then the legislation has, except if you go through this waiver process, there is no waiver process. What has to happen is that Congress has to pass new legislation 
exempting someone from the legislative requirement. And that's what really worries me most, right, is that either the law matters, in which case we should pay attention to it and not just keep saying, oh, just pass another law for just this one occasion. So either it matters or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then let's, let's get rid of that statutory prohibition because right now we're in the worst of all possible worlds where after an administration in which many of us were very concerned about rule of law issues and, and a president who, who on many occasions seemed to be not that interested in what the law said, it really bothered me that that was one of the first acts uh, of the incoming Biden administration was to say, oh, we are going to restore the rule of law norms, except not that one, not this time. That bothered me. Carol Dempsey, do you have any observations on, on this topic? Uh, you know, given the Senate confirmation process, do you think we need a statute that has a, an absolute bar? I do. Uh, for the following two reasons. Um, I would not, there were likely under my command when I was chairman, not really command as you know, under my, uh, among my peers when I was chairman, I suspect there were one or two who had there not been the statutory limit might have felt some tug to run for office, even while still in uniform. And, um, and I think, even if I'm wrong about that instinct in particular, uh, I do think that's a possibility. And, can, and on the other side of the coin, I would, you know, the military, the all volunteer force enjoys such popularity in the country um, that I would be concerned that a politician might pick a military member far less on the credential and far more to leverage their popularity for his particular uh, benefit. And so, yeah, I absolutely think there should be a statutory. By the way, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't personally have minded if I could have avoided Senator McCain on my confirmation, <laughs> hearing, but I, I wasn't able to pull that off. You know, uh, Secretary Austin said that he's gonna bring a civilian mindset to, to the job. What is a civilian mindset? And, and really, can you parse the human intellect that way? But um, what, what, what is that? Does anybody, Peter, what is what, this? What I, what I interpreted Secretary Austin to mean is that he was going to do two things. One, he was going to be assiduous about the um, embodying the, the customs and the persona of a civilian. One of the reasons why it's important for the Secretary of Defense to be civilian is he or she represents civilian control 24 seven. Yes, the president's commander in chief, but the president's doing many other things and is not thinking about uh, civilian control every single minute. But that the Secretary of Defense is the civilian that is thinking about that every single minute. And the those who were military and then served we're careful to uh, uh, observe civilian customs rather than military customs to personify this precious thing of military subordination. So when Secretary Mattis arrived at the, the E-ring, he didn't return the salute from General Dunford because as a civilian, you don't return the, the salute. Little, little things like that, which convey in a military culture an important message. And I think that, I think what Secretary Austin was saying was he's aware of that. He's, he's not gonna be called General Austin. He's gonna be called Secretary Austin, these kinds of things. That's the one thing. The second thing is I think he was very focused and is very focused and I, and I would credit, um, you know, the, the angry uh, bromides that Corey and Rosa and others have sent his way to make sure he's <laughs> sensitive to this. Um, the need to beef up the civilian side of DOD. And so he's been, uh, he's, he's messaged that, he's reinforced that, he's, he's picking high caliber people on the civilian side. He's making sure he doesn't have, um, you know, CENTICOM as his uh, headquarters uh, operation, front office operation and so forth. And the, this is uh, what I think he was, was referencing so that when, the interagency receives output from DOD. It 
reflects the best inputs from the military voice and from the civilian voice. People forget this, but that's part of DOD's function is to already blend civil military insights onto from the military um, line of action and bring that into the interagency. And then it gets merged with the diplomatic view from state and the intel view from IC and so forth. Uh, but if you don't have a strong civilian side and if your secretary of defense has a primarily military background, military orientation, then you're not getting that, the full advice you can get from DOD. Very quickly, I, I, I don't think Secretary Marshall was our worst one. Corey's throwing him under the bus unfairly. And he didn't stop the MacArthur uh, controversy, but he was vital. He, along with Bradley, was vital in ha helping the president ride it out. And it was not at all clear that the public would side with Truman rather than MacArthur. For a while, they didn't. Uh, but I think having strong military heroes beside, uh, standing with Truman was crucial for that episode ending as happily as it did. So I, I well, give Marshall a little bit more, more I, credit. I can think I of did invite the panelists that. to agree with each other, and I think I'm, I've succeeded, and, and I will <laughs> succeed with this. I think I've um, thrown shade at everybody except my co-teacher, General Dempsey. I'm not an <laughs> idiot. I know not Well, like that. let me ask you, uh, let me ask the panel this. Uh, Peter mentioned civilian control, and I would submit that historically, when you go back to the founding fathers, they were really talking about not having a standing military literally presenting a physical threat to the to the democracy. You know, since we had and we never really had much of a standing military up until after the Cold War and because of the Soviet threat and so forth. So that's in my view and correct me, panelists, uh, it's kind of morphed into something where you try to suppress uh, the military voice, the military uh, people speaking out on, on issues and so forth, because that would uh, impede the ability of the civilian leaders to get their perspective to predominate. Is that an accurate, uh, what we talk about, civilian control of the military? And so correct me. So it's an interesting challenge, Charlie. Um, I don't think it's true that the American military uh, in any way is impeded from making its views known. I actually think if you look comparatively across militaries and free societies, the American military has an enormous weight in the policy formation process and the ability to speak publicly about their views when they are contravening the commander in chief, right? When you go to testify to Congress uh, for the armed services committees, you sit right in front of that great big plaque um, that tells you that you have a responsibility that the Congress is also civilian control. So structurally, we have a system that gives the American military an enormous amount of influence even before you get to the fact that it's the most respected uh, institution in American public life. Where I think your challenge has a lot more traction is in the creeping um, belief that civil military constraints also apply to veterans. Um, and uh, there was, for example, an instance uh, in 2006 during the Iraq surge, uh, in the decisions about the Iraq surge, where um, in the Bush administration, uh, as they were moving to the dismissal of Secretary Rumsfeld, you know, that they asked the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff whether they should fire his civilian boss. And that strikes me as hair-raisingly, um, a hair-raising corrosion of the civil military norm. But more directly, they were concerned about firing the chief of staff, White House chief of staff, and the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the National Security Advisor were all concerned about firing Secretary Rumsfeld because of opposition by notable veterans like retired Lieutenant General Greg Newbold and retired Major General Paul Eaton. Uh, and that's actually, I think, a creeping 
um, area where civilian control is wrongly applied to try um, and suppress or affect the judgments of veterans who regain the political rights that every American has. And I think that's an area of legitimate concern for the active duty military. General Dempsey was quite um, influential in helping the rest of us think through how much veterans political activism uh, creates difficulties for the military leadership. But that's not something that I think is, uh, the issue isn't something that civil military relations ought to be governing. Rosa, let me pick your brain. And this is a little bit of an unfair question. Uh, one of the things that you famously had in, in your earlier book is you getting questions from the NSC about civilian control and you said, you know, the wrong civilian. Um, what do you anticipate for the Biden administration? And this may be un unknowable, so tell me if, I, if I'm being unfair. How do you think they're going to react when retired generals, and I predict I, that there are going to be, are going to start publicly criticizing uh, their activities in a way that we've seen before, as Corey has said, but I think it's, it's kind of super empowered today in, in terms of, because of, partly because of communication technology, partly because of the dispute with the previous administration. How do you think that they're going to react and what advice, if any, would you have for them? Oh, Charlie, that's, I do think that's unknowable um, for one thing. I would hope that they would react the same way they would react to criticism from any quarter, uh, which is to say, you know, if it's, if it's got validity to it, hopefully they'll pay attention. If it's just somebody, you know, being a jerk, they'll ignore it. Um, I actually, I want to go back to the earlier issue of civil, civil what is civilian control of the military and why, do we, why should we care, though? Um, as you know, I, I've, I've argued that I, I sometimes think we, we have an overly formalistic conception of civilian control of the military and lose sight of what the substantive goals of our constitutional structure uh, we're, we're aiming for. When you think about what the founders were concerned about, um, they were concerned very specifically about avoiding concentrations of power that would prevent the people from expressing their will through, 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 the, through the electoral process, through government. And at that time, certainly in 17, 1789, the military was you know, a, a very oversized uh, muscle relative to, to others, right? At that time, the ability to use uh, physical force was while not limited to the military, that the organized military was the one actor that had the potential ability to really capture the state. Um, that's not as true anymore. I mean, the military obviously has tremendous destructive capabilities today, even more so, but I often think that today we have all kinds of other more, more subtle and sometimes invisible threats to democracy threats to the people's well-being reflected in the political process um, in, in part because of things like social media, uh, because, of, because communications technologies have, allowed, have made it much easier for in, influence campaigns to be effective. And uh, incidentally, I, I actually, I think social media and communication technologies may cut the other way in terms of the influence of any retired generals. Uh, it's very hard for anybody right now with all the noise to, to break through in a significant way. Um, but I think, I think we are at a moment where destructive capabilities, both physically have been decentralized to a significant extent. We are also at a moment where non-kinetic means of, of disruption, destruction and control have proliferated. Uh, so whether, whether it's influence campaigns, whether it's the impact of big corporate dollars on campaigns, um, it's that whether it's cyber attacks and so on, that makes the military in a sense only one of numerous potential significant threats to the state. Uh, and that's, so that's not, so that's not to say that we shouldn't care about civilian control of the military, we absolutely should. 
Uh, but I think that when we when we worry about it, we should really stay focused on what are what are we trying to achieve here, and what we're trying to achieve is to is any one actor from achieving so much power that it can exercise outsized control over the decisions of the state, shutting the rest of us out. And we should worry about that with the military still, but we also need to worry about that much more than in 1789 with a lot of other actors. And that should, when we, when we see something that's sort of presenting itself as a civilian control issue, I think one of the challenges for us is to sort of distinguish between, is this a civilian control issue as a matter of uh, formalism and symbolism and etiquette, or is this something that really cuts to the heart of that concern uh, about preventing capture of the state? And we should be much more worried about the second than about the first. Uh, that is super interesting. And, and honestly, I hadn't thought about it quite that way, but that's why we have panels like this. Um, was since the, the issue of retired officers has come up and General Dempsey, I'm hoping you get your comment on this. Uh, personally, I think that the norm to the extent it existed is it's still extant because we do have six or 7,000 retired flag general officers. Uh, we only hear from a couple dozen, but that said, I think that the norm is pretty much dead. And what I've recommended is that you just have to scrutinize these people like you'd scrutinize any other person who tries to be an actor in the, uh, in the political realm. You can respect their their experience like you would respect the experience of any speaker. But uh, there has, and we have a number of questions in the, in the, uh, from audience. Is there something that should be done about retired officers that speak out in, in terms of disciplinary process or, or something like that? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I'd like to start with General Dempsey and then hear from the rest of the panelists. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. And I'm glad you made the distinction between flag, general officers and flag officers and all other veterans. Because I, you know, as you've heard me say before, I, <clears throat> I think uh, a, a flag officer has a particular responsibility because, again, because the military is, is so popular in this country, um, they speak, you know, they, they, their voice tends to be a little louder than, than everybody else's. So, yeah, you know, as you also have heard me say, pragmatically, I, you know, my general rule of thumb is that we don't want to make our successors' jobs any harder than they already are, which is, which is a reason to have an instinct to be to be quiet. Um, when when general officers and flag officers are not quiet, your question is, you know, is there some way that they should be disciplined? And I, you know, I think there, I would probably defer to somebody, to actually to my fellow panel members, my instinct would be to suggest that if it became seditious, if it became, uh, you know, if they were inciting behaviors that were, that could threaten the country, and I'm not just thinking about, you know, the events of January 6th, but, but more broadly, if they, you know, if they were, uh, if they would be considered crimes by anyone else, they should be considered crimes by general officers and flag officers if they, if they uh, use their platform to. to I, I think you, you make a good point because in theory, retired general officers remain subject to the full UCMJ. And of course that has, you know, an offense for officers of contemptuous words about certain, um, you know, certain civilian leaders, specifically the ones that have been picked out by the code as most relevant to civilian control. And I really would question the, the constitutionality as applied to a retired officer. So, so what, does, what do the rest of the panelists think about that? Should there be some sort of discipline for retired officers who, who don't say something that would be violative of the First Amendment or otherwise criminal for a civilian, but may challenge the propriety and, and this norm of, of not saying anything. What are your thoughts on that? Corey, or Dr. Shockey running? <laughs> I'm perfectly happy with you calling me Corey, Charlie. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> um, so I, I like the distinction that retired General Dempsey makes between flag officers and everyone else, because um, 
because senior people in the military do carry particular responsibilities and their voices carry particular weight. Um, but in my judgment, that's something that the norm of uh, among the sorority and fraternity of flag officers that they should police among themselves. I don't think that's a legitimate basis for reaching in uh, with punitive measures of the kind you've suggested. Uh, and for exactly the reason you suggested, Charlie, which is veterans have the exact same political rights that everyone else does. And they will stop being um, preferred spokespeople in the way that retired General John Allen and retired General Mike Flynn were in 2016, when they both spoke at political conventions. That will only stop happening. Political leaders, political movements will only stop recruiting uh, veterans' voices when the military stops being the most respected institution in American public life. So what that norm particularly relies on is the self-restraint of our military and senior veterans. Every, all of the polling that Jim and I did uh, for Warriors and Citizens shows that the American public strongly wants military voices, especially as Peter and Jim Golby and Lindsey Cohn's research has shown, especially when it agrees with their political views anyway that we're beginning to see the military the way we see the Supreme Court, that they're virtuous and the law of the land when they agree with our politics and they're tawdry and politicized when they don't. One last quick thing on this, which is that in the research Michael Robinson and I have done about veterans participation in the January 6th insurrection, veterans um, are being uh, appear to be participating in right-wing violent groups in a similar proportion to their, um, to their existence in the American body politic, namely about 15% uh, of participants in these violent right-wing groups are veterans. But what's dangerous about it is that we see these groups recruiting military veterans participation in order to legitimate the politics of the movement. And that is a real danger to the military's um, confederal relationship with the broader American body politic. If they come to be seen as recruiting grounds or leaders of these anti-constitutional movements. Yeah, I, Can I just add, add a word there, Charlie, because Corey's right about um, uh, relying on norms and policing. All professions police their own ranks, healthy professions do. And that that's what should be done in the area of policing the uh, interventions from retired uh, military officers. You, you, you don't need to resort to lawfare, as you're proposing, uh, to try to- I'm not uh, proposing, I'm asking. Voices. Um, but let's also not pretend that that when um, Michael Flynn was was speaking on the the floor of the convention that he was there because he was Michael Flynn. He was there because he was General Flynn. And the and when when they are trading on this the prestige, which comes in part from an apolitical uh, stance of the military, in order to pers to advance sharply partisan statements, then they're violating the norms of the ethics of their profession in a way that is unhealthy. And the, and the profession should, uh, should call them out on that. And General Dempsey did, and, and, um, and Admiral Mullen did, and, and others. And that's, that's what a healthy profession does. A much harder case is um, generals going on you know, cable news and second guessing the operational decisions of task forces out there and saying, well, on my day, we wouldn't have used aircraft, we would have used something else. The military hate, who are serving now hate those, that form of public commentary. That's not a civil military problem, that's a mill-mill problem. But uh, isn't, isn't that what we saw? For the public to hear that military 
experts disagree that there's not a single military expert answer to any single problem. Look, let me be devil's advocate though. Isn't that what we saw around uh, in June? We had, you know, the president, whatever you think of him, wanted to use a show of force by deploying not in the city, but near the city, uh, active duty military forces. And we had all kinds of retired generals coming on, second guessing that. And some people say that's one reason why when we came to January, the military was so hesitant to, to get involved. So it is I there... say that. I, that I've, I've said that in print that I think that was part of the reason why the military was hesitant was because they were once burned, twice shot. Yeah. Well, let, let me, uh, Professor Brooks, and sorry for calling you Rosa so much, but- um, Charlie, you can call me Rosa. I'm gonna call you Charlie. Okay, great. Um, you know, a lot of what we heard from the retired generals uh, and, and others was reminding people of their oath. In fact, uh, Paul Thornhill, I think has another article where she says that the military needs to be trained on the constitution and their oath and so forth. What concerns me about this, and as a law professor, I, I'd love to hear your perspective. You know, the Constitution is actually kind of complicated, and I'm not sure exactly how such training would go, you know, to, you know, a young person right out of high school. And I'm also really concerned that it invites people to think that they, especially in the armed forces, that they can make their own individual determination as to what the Constitution means and then act on it. Um, and, you know, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, it doesn't work that way. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? You, you know, I don't think that's a different problem than the problems we already have, um, which, which usually are fairly theoretical, right, of, of conscientious objection or people who say, uh, hey, look, um, you just ordered me to do such and such. Well, my interpretation of, uh, my interpretation of the international law of armed conflict is that that would constitute a war crime um, and their commanding officer says, well, my interpretation is that it doesn't. I, I don't know that the constitutional issue is, is any different from that, right? I mean, in any, we already have a situation which is entirely possible, at least theoretically, it happens pretty rarely that you do get somebody saying, I'm sorry, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this because my interpretation of the law differs from yours. Um, I don't think it's a very big problem, though, to be honest, and I have no particular concerns about uh, trying to make sure that uh, our, our military personnel have a minimal understanding of the U.S. Constitution. That seems to me to be something that everyone in our society should have, um, and we do a pretty terrible job of civic education in this country. That, that's, a whole, that's a whole other issue, right? Yeah, that, um, that I was just going to say that's a proverbial three beer conversation because, uh, you know, the teaching of, uh, you know, civics and history and so mm -hmm. forth in this country is, I think, does have a, a negative influence on civil military relations because there isn't enough collective knowledge. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, I, I wanted to add one thing to what Corey said earlier. Um, I'm, I'm really relieved that the percentage of veterans participating in the January 6th insurrection was more or less proportionate to their numbers in the general population um, for the reasons Corey mentioned, but the, the deliberate efforts to recruit amongst veterans and active duty military by extremists, violent extremist groups um, is also worrying for a very different, much more pragmatic reason, more urgent reason which is that many of these groups want people with military skills because they want the next, the next effort to march on the Capitol or whatever it may be, whatever their target is, to be successful. And that's pretty scary. Um, uh, that what, what saved us in a sense on January 6th, lots of things came together. Um, but part of what saved us was that the, the mob was not terribly organized. It was organized, but not organized enough uh, to be successful. And I, it, it's just chilling to imagine what a more uh, tactically sophisticated group of people could have accomplished given how poorly prepared uh, the, the police, Capitol Police, et cetera, were. Yeah, I, I think it is good to remind everyone that there are 18 million veterans and we're talking about uh, 30 or 40 that have been charged. Um, 
but I think I think uh, Corey's point is is the real concern. It's not not even so much the number in this particular incident because uh, I think the Washington Post said that the most common denominator among people is you know was financial problems, and then the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that uh, only a, a relatively small percentage of those arrests charged thus far had connection with uh, extremist groups. But I think that, that Corey's point is one I hadn't really, I should have thought about, but I think is the deliberate effort to recruit for the purposes that Rosa is raising. Let's go to a couple of things in the uh, questions in the chat um, or in the, there are um, a lot, several questions about, uh, General Dubik has one here about an apolitical uh, military and what can we do to um, uh, sustain an apolitical view? Now, some people would say the military isn't apolitical, it's nonpartisan, it should be nonpartisan, but people in the military are gonna have political views. But um, what, what are your thoughts about what, what the military can do to remain nonpartisan? Any thoughts on that, Corey? Yes, so um, one of my favorite military officers, Elmo Zumwalt, who was the chief of naval operations during the Vietnam War, writes in his, he, he promoted the first female captain in the Navy. And when he put her epaulets on her shoulders, he leaned forward and kissed her on the cheek. And he writes in his memoir that he received more hate mail about that action than anything else he did as CNO, which included the decision to spray Agent Orange. Um, uh, and Zumwa rejected the criticism by saying that you have no idea how many cheeks I had to kiss to become the chief of naval operations. And this is the first time it was a pleasure. <laughs> and I love that example because it you don't get to be the leader of any kind of organization without some political sensibilities of coalition building and what fights to choose. And right, so, so there is a, a fundamentally human instinct for politics that connects to leadership. But that's actually not what we're worried about in, in military leaders. What we are worried about is if they have sharp political edges, it becomes very difficult for them to be trusted agents by politicians. And again, the, the research that we did for warriors and citizens bears this out, that people who are it, who have politically responsible positions um, tend to trust less the um, military leadership over time if they are perceived to be political actors. And it's a difficult balance. It's very hard because on the one hand, the political, the, the suits want to hide behind the uniforms for political legitimacy. And yet they, that then creates the longer term problem of uh, increasing the stature of the uniform military vis-a-vis -vis the elected political leadership. And most, the most troubling trend for me in civil military relations in the last 30 years is the collapse of public support for elected officials and the institutions in which, to which they are elected relative to the military. The balance has really changed. Um, and the more we see the military as political actors, the more difficult the system of civil military relations in the United States becomes. Because every mili military campaign plan is a political undertaking, right? There's no American president who's ever given 100% of effort to the war not Abraham Lincoln, not the Continental Congress, not FDR. It's always about trade-offs between uh, how much effort to give to this versus other things. And that's fundamentally a political judgment, not a military one. 
and, and let me jump and Jeremy Dempsey, say I'd like to hear from you on on how to try to keep the military apolitical. But since uh, Corey raised it, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at the article that Risa Brooks wrote. Please, listeners, I'm saying the word Risa Brooks, who is a different human being. She's at Marquette. She's a political scientist. Than our panelists today, uh, Rosa Brooks. Charlie, and, you're you're undermining our brilliant plan, which is to pretend to be the same person, just an exceptionally <laughs> yeah. productive person. And then you can have the power of bivocation, so which we which we all want. But anyway, she says uh, that one of the the biggest mistakes or challenges or whatever civil military relations is this notion that military officers put themselves apart from pol partisan politics or politics and that they they press for the this is goes back to the whole Huntington the classic and you know architectures for civil military relations and she says that's a mistake for exactly the reason Corey says that uh, everything involves politics and if you don't take that factor in or you operate with the belief that you don't have to worry about it that it's the civilians problem you're not going to be giving good advice General Dempsey, why don't you take a shot at this a little unfair shot at that, and also a shot at uh, what can we do to keep the military nonpartisan? And and you used the power of the pulpit when you were in uh, chairman, but is that enough? Well, first, I, I do want to make a distinction between apolitical and nonpartisan, and I want to align myself with those <clears throat> who have said you know, the military should be nonpartisan, but we should not expect it to be apolitical. I mean, you know, the- Jim Goldie, I think is- Yeah, uh, and so that becomes particularly clear when, um, when dealing with general officers and flag officers. And, and you ask what we can do to make sure they understand the distinction. And we have, we have a, uh, an, a professional military education plan across all the services and, and a joint, program as well, where Peter Fever, in fact, happens to be one of our, uh, one of the people we rely upon to help the flag, the new flag officers and the three stars, because we also make a distinction between one and two stars and three and four stars because of the level yes. of responsibility and the, and the, and the platform. And, and what we, what we insist upon is that they, uh, that they recognize that the advice they give is just that, it's advice. And, and the elected officials and appointed officials actually don't have to take it. And we also try to make sure they understand that friction is built into our system, starting from the three branches of government, but all the way down to the point where in the interagency process, at interagency working groups, you're gonna have 10 to 12 representatives from across the government who are going to disagree with each other. And that our role in that is to provide our military advice, eventually, but you're, you're giving that advice in a political environment. Now, one thing I, I wanna say, I think, I think we, you know, you asked, did we, do we do enough? I think we do a pretty good job at the general officer and flag officer level. We, we haven't baked into the professional military education system, um, too much of this too soon. And, and we may have to reconsider that. And I say that because of a recent experience where I was speaking with an ROTC detachment and the senior enlisted advisor, he was a, a sergeant major, not a command sergeant major, had just left Fort Bragg, North Carolina to take this job uh, that he was in now with ROTC cadets. And I said to him, anything different you know, about this issue um, you know, since you, when you came in the army 24, 25 years ago and now, and he said, yeah, he said, what's different is all of these young men and women at a young age are talking about politics. They're talking about their political views. Sometimes they're arguing and sometimes fighting about their political views. And so let me end my, my remarks and pass it to the others by saying that anytime something happens in society, we should absolutely expect it to happen in the military because we're grabbing America's sons and daughters out of, you know, out of their homes where they are 
in some families having reasonable conversations about this and in some families they're having unreasonable conversations about this. This is like blue bloods, you know, the show. We're taking those kids off that table and whatever they're hearing at that table, they're bringing it with them. And I think we have to understand that. Any other thoughts on, on this notion of that we've emphasized too much an apolitical military and, and Reese's idea that we need to, military officers need to incorporate poli the political dimension into their advice. So I kind of, in my said, experience- yeah. Peter that, Fever um, coined the phrase that elected officials have the right to be wrong, that he shouldn't skirt out from addressing this after Dr. Brooks does. <laughs> Corey, you've given me a PhD. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, no, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. I, I think, uh, you know, my line is, is if war is politics by other means, uh, it, it's still politics. Um, you can't, there's no such thing as an apolitical military decision. Um, it doesn't make any sense. We wouldn't, we wouldn't really want there to be. It doesn't make, it, it just is, it's sort of a contradiction in terms, right? Um, of course, the military is political, has to be political, should be political debates about what kinds of military actions to take have, you know, they have political impact. Uh, we have to think about that. But there is a distinction obviously that others have drawn. And I think that's quite right between being political and being partisan. And I think we should worry about the latter but not so much about the former. What, one thing I do worry about, and I'll just draw everybody's attention if they haven't seen this already, um, if, if I can actually find it, there's a great article uh, just out in the Texas National Security Review by uh, Sue Bryant and, and Jim Dempsey um, and Brett Sweeney on rising evidence of military exceptionalism, as they call it. They, they, did, a, they did a lot of recent polling. Uh, and one of the things that they found, um, which I think is consistent with earlier polling, but, but maybe more pronounced, is, is the degree to which uh, military personnel viewed values within the military as greatly superior to values outside of the military, you know, viewed the military as, as, not, as, as essentially a, a place of greater civic virtue uh, than the civilian world. And, and the authors flag that as somewhat concerning. Uh, and I think I, you know, I share the concern um, in, because I do think that in terms of how a member of the military perceives the distinctions between politics and partisanship and how they justify their own actions or beliefs to themselves, that a view that we are more virtuous than the rest of you, hoi polloi, is, is not a good thing to have. And there's, there's a lot of other interesting stuff in that article and I, I encourage everybody to read it, including, including some worrying things about the degree to which uh, African-Americans and women take pride in their military service in contrast to uh, white, white men, um, but that's a whole other topic, but it's a great article. Yeah, let, let me, I, I did read that article. And, and one thing that struck me, uh, I didn't see the focus so much on the on values being superior, that there was more just basic elitism. And, and I, I'd like to hear uh, some other comment on this in the few remaining minutes we have, because you know, the fact is that 70 to 75% of young Americans can't even qualify for the military even if they wanted to join. And part, I think, and General Dempsey, you know, correct me on this, part of getting a military organization to succeed, especially in combat, is to give them a, something of a sense of exceptionalism, that they can succeed, that they're better than the enemy, that they're going to, to prevail, not that, hey, the enemy, everyone's just as good as we are and so forth. General Dempsey, what, what are your thoughts on that? I disadvantage because I know you haven't had a chance to see the article. No, that's okay. But I, here's what I would say. I, we absolutely want to persuade and convince and reinforce at every opportunity with our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines that they're better than any other military in the world, but they're not better than the civilian populace that they serve. And that uh, there's always the risk that we, you know, we begin to feel entitled. And we speak about that a great deal. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the real meaning of that article. I think it's more the way Rosa characterized the article than, than maybe the way I wrote it. Uh, we, we're running can out I, of time. Charlie, can I just hop in? Because it, it, Th it This will be your, your final comment, and then everybody else will have a, a oh, quick well, comment. 
Uh, first of all, I wanted to make sure that Heidi Urban got credit because she was co-author on that uh, that great article. She's um, another one of the top people around. But um, the there is an element of uh, mil military exceptionalism that uh, is pernicious and that links to the political point that we were making in the earlier thread. The, when the military are testifying before Congress, uh, a lot of military senior military will sit there thinking, I'm here representing the national interests and I'm speaking to a whole bunch of politicians who will have parochial political interests and, and political True. with a pejorative uh, sense of it. And that's, that's very pernicious. First of all, it means that the hearing is not likely to go well for you because the Congress, members of Congress will sense that out and go after you. But second of all, it, it, uh, it, it is unfairly describing the military viewpoint. Because of course, that officer might actually just be representing the parochial views of the Air Force, which may or may not be in the larger national security interest. And that the, uh, the member of Congress was elected by voters who absolutely constitute the national interest. Uh, and so these are actually debates about competing conceptions of the national interest. That's part of what politics is. And so in that sense, the military is a voice in that larger political um, uh, debate. I, what I worry about with Risa Brooks's article, it was very clever and well, well argued, but in the wrong hands, it could, mis, it, it could be misunderstood to say, ah, therefore, you know, we should be fighting in a, in a sort of Milburn kind of way. 20 years ago, there were articles, uh, Milburn and others were arguing that that sort of had the military as as one of the combatants in the domestic political fight. Uh, and, and let's hope that the military wins in that fight kind of way. And that that is not, I don't think, what Risa means. Um, but that it, she could be read that way. And that would be unhelpful for all the reasons that General Dempsey, Rosa, and, and uh, Corey said. Well, before I, I get to the, the questions, which I really do, people have all kinds of questions here, but um, how about some commentary on that? Uh, on Corey, do you have any any thoughts? I don't know if you've had a chance to look at Risa's article or not. Yeah, uh, I do. I have a practical concern. I agree with Risa conceptually, but I have the practical concern that I think if you normalize the military thinking of itself as political, uh, it's very difficult to calibrate where they should stop being political. And so I would rather have the problems of military naivete, of thinking of themselves as apolitical and striving to be so, than I would the problems of a military where everybody thinks they're as good a politician as somebody who can get elected to office in this country because it's, it's uh, factually incorrect and it's incredibly damaging to the relationship between the American public and its military. That, that is super interesting. Uh, just getting back to the point of of elitism and and this little bit off topic, Rose, but I'm going to put you on it. When you went through the police force training, at the end of the day, I think I know the answer to this, but but let's hear it from the author. What, what was your view of that? I mean, what what do you think the police force think how it thinks of itself? Because in a way, they go in harm's way, like like and they have to deal with violence and so forth. Uh, is there an effort to make them feel better than everybody else so that they can do that hard job? Or I think you know, yeah. know what I'm, yeah. I'm trying to get at. It's, it's a great question. And, and, and before I jump into it, um, yes, apologies to Heidi Urban. I, I somehow inserted Jim Gulby into authorship of that article quite incorrectly, um, it's, but it's a great piece. Um, um, yeah, lots of interesting stuff there, Charlie. And what, what initially led me to an interest in, in policing was thinking about the, the increasing blurriness between what war fighting looks like in many places around the world and what policing in, in the US looks like. Uh, and of course, in the US, there are places and moments when policing starts looking a bit like war fighting. 
and I so I started out thinking about that the, those areas of convergence and um, a couple of points I'd make really quickly. Uh, one is that most police academies and law enforcement academies in the in this country are still modeled after sort of a 1980s version of military boot camp. Um, uh, you know, there's a tremendous amount of you know, you don't speak unless you're spoken to, uh, get down and give me 20. Um, uh, I'm going to shout at you if, you're, if your boots are not shined properly. I think that's pretty awful. The, 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 the case that others make for that kind of paramilitary model of police education is, oh, yes, but, but police officers have to learn obedience to legitimate authority and they have to learn self-discipline. My own view is, is that I don't think even the military trains in quite that way at this point. Um, I, think, I think military training has, has evolved significantly. My worry is that, and I also think that police officers have a very different role. And my worry is that if you, if you yell at them for not obeying, uh, if the instructors yell at them for not obeying, that too many recruits take away the message that it's okay to yell at people who don't obey you. And if you're told to do 50 push-ups until you're exhausted for not having your boots polished properly, the lesson that some people are going to take away from that is that when people do, do disobey you, it's okay to inflict physical pain on them, which I don't think is a lesson that we particularly ought to be instilling in uh, police officers in this country. Um, I, think that, I think that a more civilianized version of police training, uh, and what that means in this context is complicated too, but um, would be better. I, I also think one of the things that really struck me about the police training was the, the emphasis on, you know, any situation could turn lethal at any moment. Anyone could kill you at any time. There's no such thing as a routine call. You must always be on your guard for the person who's reaching into their pocket, reaching into a bag, because they could, any one of them could pull out a weapon and shoot you at any time. And that's obviously both totally true. Of course, that's true uh, and profoundly misleading because it leads police officers to have a really exaggerated sense of the degree of, of physical risk they face, which statistically is not actually all that high. And I heard over and over again in the police academy, uh, instructors telling recruits, you have a right to go home safe. And I thought, what a weird thing to say in a sense. I, you know, I don't think we tell you know, Gen uh, General Dempsey, Charlie, you know, tell me if this is wrong. I don't think we tell soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, you have a right to go home safe. I think we tell them the mission, your lives are very important and the mission is very important and we're not going to squander your lives. We're not gonna be reckless with your lives and you have a right to defend yourself, but the mission takes priority. And in the, in the case of policing, the mission is protecting communities and members of the communities police officers serve, not protecting not your own life, no matter what. And I do worry that that being being so officers being so primed to imagine threats coming from any place, any time leaves too many officers seeing threats coming from everyone all the time. And in, and, and and coupled with the message of you have a right to go home safe, that some officers, not most, but some, forget that members of the public have a right to go home safe too. And what we see, I think this is, this is not the only reason we have such a high rate of police officer involved shootings in this country, but it's one of the contributing reasons is that the training creates a lot of very jumpy police officers uh, who, who overreact and, and we push the costs of any mistakes in the degree to which they're assessing threats accurately the cost of that of those mistakes are mostly borne by members of the public, you know, which to me is the wrong way around. Yeah, General Dempsey, actually, or General Mattis is, is going to speak to this uh, idea that some military officers embrace that their people are more important than anything else when actually the mission plays in there. But you raised something interesting. Uh, Rosa, you wrote an article, uh, I think last June, about policing, and, and you pointed out that only 12% 12 of police are women, yet studies show uh, that women make better police officers, even in violent situations. And um, I'm in the process of writing an article be because of you, Rosa, that basically says that uh -oh. we, should, we should have a draft for women into the police forces. Uh, but it raises a larger issue. I think it is related to civil military relations. And we have a, several questions uh, from the audience about uh, 
national service and specifically a draft. I, I think I think most people would agree that that we should open draft registration to to men and women, but it is a selective service, and there are there is a pretty gross underrepresentation of women in uh, in the combat arms because uh, DoD did a study where they they don't want to go in, but there's no reason women can't be in the high tech arms. Uh, but it's the competition with the civilian sector. Do you think a uh, we should we should have a conscription or national mandatory national service, one of which people could go into the police forces? That would be one way of fulfilling it. But also into the military, and should it be selective till we can get enough women into these combat units, um, either? you know, the combat, ground combat, or the high tech, so that we can achieve parity to build the pool so that we can select senior leaders, for, you know, have, have a more diverse pool uh, to select senior leaders. Um, yes, I think we should have national service and no, I don't think it should be mandatory, but yes, I think there should be strong incentives built into it with the aim of getting to a situation where, where the large majority of young Americans participate. Um, yes, I think we should make conscious efforts to figure out how to recruit within that, within our, within our imaginary future national service scheme. We should make conscious efforts to figure out how to recruit more women into combat arms, um, but no, I don't think we should we should conscript them from within that. Um, you, you don't I, think, I think we should. Other, I think there are other ways to do it. You, you don't think we should selectively uh, draft women athletes and so forth to? No, into... <laughs> I don't. No, I, partly because I, I, you know, I, I think why turn to coercive means when you have non-coercive means available, and I, I think that we have we collectively we as a society. Uh, have not nearly exhausted the non-coercive means to increase the percentage of women in, in combat arms, uh, military occupational specialties, in law enforcement, et cetera. There are, so so I, I, don't, I don't think you turn to coercion uh, as your, your first step. I think that is a, a last step in dire emergencies. Um, and I can think of lots of other ways to accomplish that goal without having to turn to uh, conscription. Well, let's see, let's hear what the other panelists may think of, of conscription, and let's focus on conscription for the military. Um, do do you think that we should have a draft, a mandatory draft for the armed forces, uh, selective? It is selective service, so it wouldn't be everybody. Would that be a positive or a negative in terms of civil military relations? It, it also often struck me, and and I may be the only perhaps General Dempsey, we may be the only ones who, who are old enough to remember when lots of congressmen used to cite their, their conscript level service as the rationale that they were now experts on you know, high level military strategy. Corey, what, what do you think? I think free societies uh, should have only extremely limited ability to coerce their publics, and then only for reasons of national emergency, not for social engineering good outcomes, not for creating virtue in the populace. Um, I, I think philosophically, it's a danger in a free society to trend that direction. General Dempsey, do you think that, that we can get enough uh, women in particular into the you know, the combat arms or into, can we recruit enough STEM focused women to fill the high tech billets? Or do you think that we should look at conscription? I don't think we should look at conscription at all. It's a waste of time. It'll never happen. And, and were it to happen, it would be very poorly administered and quickly set aside again. On the other hand, I do think that men and women should register for the potential of a draft in, as, as uh, Corey said, a national emergency, men and women. And then to the point of women in particular, although we could talk about any, any number of ways to measure the diversity of the armed forces. I, look, I've said when I was chairman and long before, 
our our mantra ought to be if you can meet the standard you can serve in the position and i and i don't think that should be coercive i think it should be work we should work on it uh, you know we only rescinded the combat exclusion for women in 2013 and at the time i actually said it's going to take us about 20 years a gen <clears throat> pardon me a generation to see the effect of that because people tend to go where their mentors or their role models have gone before them. And that's, you know, that's still true uh, today. So you I know, that is true work it out. with the combat exclusion for ground combat, but women have been in the aviation, combat a aviation yes, since the early 1990s. And mm -hmm. General Brown, who's going to be speaking later this afternoon, he made the observation that, you know, 20 years ago, there were two, you know, when he was coming up, there were 2% of women in combat aviation. And he said, today there's 2% of women in com combat aviation. And, uh, and the, the general numbers in society of all pilots, it's only 5%. I don't know how the military is gonna be able to compete um, to, to change that. And I think we do need to, to change it. Peter, well, what, I, what are your thoughts? Just, you mentioned that I was in, uh, I actually entered the army when it was still, it was hybrid at the time. Conscription had been ended, but the conscripts that they had drafted were still with me. And then in probably my first 10 years in the army were all about transitioning from a conscript army to an all volunteer force. And I can tell you that the all volunteer force just happens to be a better force. Not so pragmatically, when people are doing something they want to do and, and you can help them do it, you're much better off. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Peter. No, no, I, I, well, I was just going to say, agree that. I, I remember the, you know, it was kind of full employment for lawyers with, at that period when we still had conscripts in there because they, they were problems and so forth. But on the other hand, we only had, uh, Rosa, when I first came in the JAG Corps, I think we only had three women. And now, the lawyer piece is like 51, 52% women in the well, JAG Corps. Charlie, I can't, I can't help just jumping in to say, uh, I don't know what this means, but um, just skimming the, the questions in the Q&A, there are, appear to be 28 questions, not a single one of which appears to be from a woman. Says something, so, doesn't it? Peter? Yeah, I, I wanna go back to the larger question of cons conscription, which is, that conscription into the military is never presented as a solution, as a way of making the military more capable or more able to fight under the laws of armed conflict as we understand them today. Uh, the, those who are the strongest advocates for conscription seem to be wanting a military that's less usable, less deployable, uh, less capable of fighting uh, and defending American interests. Uh, and they believe that if we had this conscript force, we wouldn't be as tempted to use the military and, they, and, and that they see as, as a plus. So I'm with General Dempsey and others who say uh, that conscript into the military is, not, uh, is a solution that's worse than the, uh, sorry, a cure that's worse than the disease. However, national service uh, is a different, uh, a different item and while I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I'd be willing to see whether you could actually get something that is co um, compulsory. I tend to agree with General Dempsey and Rosa that the politics are not there for that. And so you're probably not gonna get compulsory service. But what I would like to see is a change in attitude, beginning with the military, but more broadly through the country, the attitude that there's only one form of national service and it's called serving in the military and everybody else is being served. And that's just not the case. I'll tell you what, we as a society are being served by people who are willing to teach middle school uh, um, math and civics and people who are willing to uh, clean asbestos off of, the, off of um, walls and stuff. All of these kinds of jobs are national service of a different sort. And while military service has some special dimensions to it and we should never forget that and we honor that, I would like to see the military leading the way, thanking others, non-military people for their service, thanking frontline responders, healthcare professionals, et cetera, uh, and middle school teachers. And I think that 
that that would change the frame of citizenship in our country so that the military aren't super citizens, but they, but boy, do I thank them for their service as I yeah, think. I, for, uh, I think service. you have a good point. And unfortunately that'll, that'll have to be the last point because we, we've run a little bit over. Uh, I do think military service has some special demands that we don't see in other areas, but I do think that uh, the idea of national service with other options, including policing, actually, uh, incentivized uh, is something we ought to think about. Listen, I can't thank you all enough. This has been a fantastic panel. And I must say, personally, my mind has been changed on a couple of issues. Corey, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> and Rosa, and Pete, even Peter changed my mind. So of course, General Dempsey, whatever he says is- I'll believe it when I see it. Are. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. And folks, we'll be back in, in, in about 10 minutes with General Madison. We'll try to engage some of these other uh, questions. And I, I hope the women in the audience uh, get motivated to ask a, ask a few questions as, as Rosa in her very alert way has identified to us. Thank you so much. See you in at, uh, on the hour. Thank you. Bye now. Hi, General Mattis, I'm gonna start your video just to do a quick audio and video check. Okay, is this is that you, uh, Isabel? Yes, sir, um, sounds great, looks great. Um, we'll be back in about seven minutes um, and okay. General Dunlap will introduce you. Okay, I'll go back on mute and, and stop my video, but I'm monitoring from here. Yes, sir. Thank you.